appearance before us, but the first we focus very much on um, the sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment issues. What we want to do is spend the first part of today's session on some broad general issues and then move on to look specifically at the Voluntary National Review and the Sustainable Development Goals. So if I could ask you really briefly what you see as the vision now for UK development and aid strategy and in particular your priorities as Secretary of State. Right. Um, well, I mean, what, what, <laughs> firstly, very, very happy to be here. Um, <coughs> secondly, to try to frame the uh, conversation in a, in a realistic framework. Uh, I've been in this role now for a matter of weeks, and, and there is a non-trivial possibility that I will not be in this role in four weeks' time. So I'm approaching that question uh, from the uh, point of view of what I can achieve in a relatively short period of time. If I'm lucky enough to be reappointed when the new Prime Minister comes in in July, I will then be able to lay out what I think would be a more realistic strategy for a two-year tenure. But at the moment, I'm trying to think about what I can achieve in a relatively short period. Within a relatively short period, my two main priorities are to firstly uh, put climate and the environment at the heart of what DFID does. And I've set out an objective to double the amount that we spend on climate and environment within our budget. And that's because I think the distinction between development, climate and the environment is a false distinction and that will become increasingly clear over the next few years and we need to uh, get that in there. And that isn't just about money, it's also about the expertise and the skills within our department. So we were actually probably had more people working on the environment 15 years ago than we do today, mm. ironically. Many of those people went off to work for environmental NGOs. So there's also a question about building up expertise. The second major change that I want to try to bring in is a change to the way that we do business, the sort of how of development rather than the what. And that is about making sure that we have much more expertise in the field right? Uh, so that we have health advisors, education advisors, yeah. uh, out there able to yeah. uh, really ensure that the programs we're delivering are much more about quality than quantity. My, my biggest concern coming on from when I was a junior minister in this department uh, related to my anxiety that we, for example, would boast that we'd get enrolment up to 90% of girls in Malawi, yeah. but that at the end of seven years they'd be unable to read or write. Absolutely, right. absolutely. Um, absolutely. So those, those would be my two. Uh, Brilliant. which I'd characterise as, I suppose, uh, climate environment and people and quality. Thank you. I mean, you've, you, you mentioned the possibility that, I guess, this could be your second and final appearance before as the Secretary of State, and you've said that you wouldn't serve in a cabinet led by Boris Johnson. Is that something you'd reconsider? No. Okay. okay. Can I ask about the CSR and what your sense is of going into a comprehensive spending review and how, what the department would be seeking from a CSR. Yeah. So, clearly we're in an unusual position, having come from the Ministry of Justice into DFID, uh, that we're not uh, bidding around the overall envelope spent on overseas yes. government. Although it is important that GNI continues to rise. A lot of our planning assumptions have been predicated Absolutely. on the assumption that our economy grows. Uh, if we were to end up in a situation where our economy grew significantly more slowly, mm. you know, if the Absolutely. medium worst case <laughs> predictions the Bank of England or the OECD proved to be correct, yeah. uh, that, that would pose a problem for us. Um, however, uh, that said, that really means that what we're talking about is two types of allocation within an overall envelope the proportion of overseas development assistance which is spent by this department as opposed to other departments and the proportion within uh, the envelope that we get, whether it's 70% or 75% or 78% of the odor envelope that we end up receiving, uh, that we spend on separate programs and from my point of view the amount that we spend on people. So the um, you know, we, we currently spend between 2 and 3% of our overall budget on our people. Right, which is very, very, very low. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the other extreme, we look at the Foreign Office, they probably spend you know, 85 90% of their budget on people. Um, mm -hmm. And if you look at other development agencies, so the US would probably spend 5 5.5%, mm -hmm. the Germans even more than that. 
so uh, I think in order to really do what we need to do, whether it's value for money in the field or um, decreasing our reliance on consultants, mm. another thing I want to do. I mean, a lot of this requires having simply more full-time staff and uh, that's a good thing to do because a lot of the countries we operate in, particularly the, the fragile conflict affected states, require an enormous amount of knowledge of mm. that context. And if we don't have the right people on the ground, then that won't work. So within the CSR framework, the two things that I, if I were lucky enough still to be here, would be pushing for <laughs> is the doubling the amount of the budget within our uh, allocation that's spent on climate and the environment, and secondly, increasing the amount that we uh, spend on people. Music to my ears. I mean, certainly, I think on climate, which we'll pursue, pursue in a moment, but on the other matter, that is precisely something this committee has recommended that a larger amount of the Great. department's budget should go on your own stuff. Just one more from me. How confident are you that whatever happens in this leadership contest, there will still be a Department for International Development and we will still be committed to 0.7% as a country? Well, I, th I think I'm very confident about the latter. It seems to me that both Boris Johnson and Jeremy Hunt have remained committed to the 0.7%. Um, there's been talk from both the candidates about reorganisation. Mm -hmm. My assumption is that that is a reorganisation in which there would remain a department and a secretary of state, but with more influence perhaps exercised by the Foreign Secretary. But I would imagine that neither of them are up for changing the primary legislation which creates this department and which secures the GNI expenditure. Thank you very much. Chris. Yeah, that's quite troubling to hear, actually. Um, last month you said that you would double um, aid for climate change to $2.2 billion annually, and, and I've said on the floor in the House to you that I welcome that. Um, what I wanted to know, though, where is that money coming from? Where is it going to be drawn from? Well, um, the money would have to come out of our odour allocation, so it's not additional money. So uh, it becomes much easier to find that money if our GNI continues to increase. So if the overall size of the economy continues at the projected rate, uh, then uh, we can find, over a five-year period, an additional billion pounds without having to cut anything. But if the economy didn't continue to grow at that rate, then we would have to find it from elsewhere. And where would that be? Because that's the main concern here. Would it be within the existing budget? Would projects get cancelled or withdrawn? Or? Well, Chris, I mean, e e let, let's sort of try to think this through. So, if um, so, even under the worst case scenarios for no deal Brexit, the assumption is that the economy would continue to grow. It would just grow more slowly. So that figure that we would have a lose eight percent of GDP over fifteen years. It's, it's not an assumption that we're going into negative growth. So even if we weren't able to secure the full uh, amount of money out of growth, um, many hundreds of millions of it would come out of the growth of the economy, even in a bad economic scenario. Uh, so you are looking at some range, I guess, between zero and um, potentially three or four hundred million pounds in the worst case scenario that you'd need to find. That would have to be a discussion uh, for my successors, but if I were in the post, I would probably be looking at reducing our allocation to some of our multilateral partners. So I think the question of whether you give, for the sake of argument, uh, 1.4 billion to the World Bank or 1.2 billion pounds to the World Bank uh, is probably an easier conversation to have than to have a conversation cutting individual health and education programs within our bilateral budget. So if we're going to continue this increasing bilateral approach, what I wanted to know really was how you're going to, what you're going to spend this additional money on and how is it going to reach the poorest and most vulnerable uh, in the countries that are most uh, impacted by climate change? Chris, I think that it's important to understand that if we don't tackle climate change, there will be a hundred million more poor people than we currently have. In other words, it's been very tempting for this department to think in the short term that we can't spend money on climate because there are all these poor people out there. And if we spend money on trying to ensure that China isn't building another 300 gigawatts of coal-fired power stations, uh, that is at the expense of poor people. But the harsh reality is that if we don't start tackling climate and the environment, 
we're actually going to be going backwards, not forwards. We'll end up with more poor people. So the challenge that I would make to the department is that, um, broadly speaking, if I try to get a sheet of paper to illustrate my session on this, the, the, the risk is that we tended to think about these two circles of environment and poverty in, in this fashion. And the, the risk is that you end up functioning only in the overlap. And that overlap sometimes turns out to be actually not a very good place to be either for poverty or for yeah. the environment. In other words, um, to take an extreme example, if you were trying to deal with poverty uh, in Indonesia, you might be focusing on the The, the, the peri-urban population in Surabaya. If you were worried about uh, environment in Indonesia, you might be thinking about sustainable forestry projects in Kalimantan. The risk of trying to operate in the overlap is that you end up being tempted to pick mm. a poor community on the edge of a forest in Kalimantan, believing that by doing so you're providing alternative livelihoods to take them away from forestry, but you end up targeting relatively few people who may not be, um, that may not be the most effective way of tackling poverty in Indonesia or the most effective way of tackling climate change. So sometimes we're going to have to, I believe, make the choice of saying, if this is a really good project on climate or the environment, and if we believe very strongly and we have the evidence that in the end that project is going to have a real effect on poverty, we may actually have to target our money directly, uh, for example, on the trees. I mean, we might have to actually plant trees. Mm -hmm. And that might be because we have an argument about what that means for carbon, or that might be we have an argument of what that means for ecosystems or flooding, or it might be an argument of what that might mean for sustainable incomes for those communities. Um, but that's, that's quite a shift in the way that we think, because we've tended to assume that the best way to deal with humans is to target your money to humans. Sometimes, in the long run, the best way to help humans is to target your money on non-humans. And just in terms of targeting the money, the money so far has been more or less split between adaptation and mitigation. Yeah. Do you see it continuing like that, or do you see, well, you've just mentioned about moving away from adaptation and mitigation for humans, but also looking at nature, but also about loss and damage, particularly with increasing crises that are happening around the world as a result of extreme weather that we've seen, for example, Mozambique and the Caribbean and elsewhere? Yes, I mean, I'd hope that the my successor, or indeed myself if I'm lucky enough to stay in this role, would try to address crises such as Mozambique um, out of our humanitarian allocations. So you're right that almost certainly the driving factor behind a lot of these humanitarian crises, and that may be true of uh, tsunamis and flooding that will also be <coughs> of desertification and uh, malnutrition in Somalia caused by loss of harvest of sun may be climate driven but I would anticipate that we would try to address that through a separate humanitarian budget because I don't, I don't want to be perpetually double counting mm. I mean if you okay. made it too broad yeah. then almost everything we do could be badged as climate and I want to have a significant shift towards more climate work yeah. okay, Thank you Lloyd interested on what you were saying earlier, Rory, around um, moving the, to free up the money, moving from multilateral to bilateral. Mm. Your um, predecessor talked about spending aid where it couldn't be spent any better. In terms of spending on bilateral for climate change action, do you think that that is the best way to tackle this? Or actually, could we leverage more by using that 1.4 million, billion, or whatever the figure was that you yep. quoted yep. in the World Bank to say, we're going to put conditionality on this that we're giving to the World Bank, we're going to require you to leverage more of this money. Is, is the better option to withdraw and spend bilaterally, or can we leverage to spend money better within the system? And, and have well, you made, I, had a conscious yeah. thought about the balance yeah. of that? No, no, I, I, I haven't had a conscious thought. And I think that needs to be driven by evidence. I think there's definitely cases where our multilateral partners do better than we do. And we need to be very hard-headed about that. This needn't be a, an issue of 
pride. It's simply a question of who can do it best in which places. So, um, uh, I mean, to take... I'm completely non-ideological about this. I mean, you know, I feel very strongly that UNICEF was the right partner for us on education in Lebanon, uh, where I might have felt Save the Children was in Afghanistan. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not... I don't have any energy. I, I signed off on a big World Bank educational grant in Ethiopia. So, so I'm, if the multilateral agencies are the best way of delivering this, um, uh, they would be. But like, I was just trying to yeah. deal with the Chris question. So the first thing is that I don't think we're going to have to cut into existing programs. I'm hoping that this is well within the framework of what we would expect to generate from normal economic growth. I think there's also potentially a Brexit dividend, which is that, depending on the decisions that are made on the amount of money that we're currently allocating through European mechanisms, that money also might be made available to DFID for us to spend. I think all I was trying to say is that in terms of um, where I would be most likely to go for the money, my sense is a reduction. I was trying to take a, a, a very large example of this, but we're occasionally making allocations to some of our big partners like the bank of well over a billion pounds and if I'm looking for another 100, 200 million it's probably easier to do that than to go to our Malawi country program yeah. which might be only a 65 million pound program yeah. I, 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 I get that totally yeah. so you talk about doing this analysis and you've only got a short amount of time left but is that something that might be, you would instruct officials to do an analysis of where best mm. climate change money yeah, is good. spent yeah. good. in multilateral Yes, world. absolutely. But, but, but I think to do it really well, we also, to return to my other point, we need to have more staff who are really focused on climate and the environment. So that's both that's recruiting people in, that's also training up our staff. I mean, our staff are very, very sophisticated experts on poverty, on specific issues like health and education, as economists. But there is a general, if, if we're going to green the whole department, which is what I'm keen to do, we, we need to make sure that everybody has at least the beginnings of an awareness around the issues around climate environment. And, and that then means that in making that judgment on whether to give the money to the bank or through a particular UN fund, we have people who are very, very confident about the field and understand what those choices mean. Varendra. Hi, Richard. Given the recent changes uh, in leadership in DFIDs, does disability inclusion remain a priority for DFIDs? Yes, disability inclusion is a very, very large priority. I mean, it's true that I suspect if my predecessor, indeed if Priti Patel had been sitting here, they would have mentioned disability as probably their top priority, and I happen to be focusing on climate and environment. But uh, I think I was the junior minister in DFID when uh, yes. Priti decided to make disability priority. I thought that was a very, very good decision. It was a place where the UK could really show leadership. It was something where three years ago very few other actors were really doing very much. And it's clear that um, it, it, it builds into a bigger principle which is going to be important to us going forward, which is that in many ways, we don't control the major levers over how fast the country grows. But we can get engaged in a values conversation, particularly around vulnerable and marginalised communities and protecting them. And disability is a very good example of that. Gender is another good example of that. Um, I think human rights is another good lens through which to think about the role that DFID can play, that, that our role is not just can we make, for the sake of argument, Myanmar or Jordan or Ghana or Zambia grow 0.2% faster in their GDP, but can we go with them on a journey where we are respectfully questioning and challenging them to shift attention to some, some things like disability which might not otherwise get attention. As a Secretary of State, what steps have you taken to ensure continued leadership and commitment to the disability portfolio is communicated across defect? 
I think probably two things. One of them is making it very clear when I took over the role that disability continued to be, as did gender, as did protection, a huge priority for me, so that I was not... Um, you know, my message to the Permanent Secretary and to Nick and the other Director Generals was to say that I'm not intending them to deprioritize their other activities. So I, I didn't come into the department saying that because I want to put a focus on climate and the environment, I want them to stop the work they're doing and the other things. I tried to use a sort of 85%, 15% model in which I tried to say, look, please believe that you can continue doing these things that you believe in and that you've invested in. I'm not going to try to stop any of that work. And disability would be a very strong example of that. Uh, we've now built up a really strong team on it. We're taking strong leadership on that. This is also true on other issues. Um, the department is a much stronger place now on uh, information technology, communications, artificial intelligence than it was when I was in the department two and a half years ago. And again, you know, that's something that I'm very keen to, to let them keep going. Um, yeah. Richard. There's been some pretty horrific scenes in Sudan in the last few weeks. Could you give us an idea about how DFID is responding to the unrest and the Crackdown. <coughs> um, yes, although I haven't actually been to Sudan this time, and I haven't actually even been to South Sudan now for 14 months, so I'm, I'm out of date in terms of my indirect things. Our permanent secretary has just been in Ethiopia and has been dealing with uh, refugees from Sudan and Ethiopia talking to them. Um, most of the focus from HMG has been on the political track, trying to get some sort of undertakings uh, from the regime, uh, trying to support the African Union in its attempt to engage, uh, providing humanitarian assistance as we continue to do. Uh, we're of course anxious, as you would be, about what seems to be happening now in Darfur as well. Yeah. I'm worried about the consequences also for this for South Sudan itself. Um, but this has also taken place in a situation in which we've had to evacuate staff, take families out. Um, so this is um, after many years of a, um, a regime, a very authoritarian, um, unpleasant regime, mm. but that was there for decades to suddenly come down, puts us not quite in the situation we were in in Libya or in Iraq, but uh, certainly in a situation where we, we're um, trying to adjust. So, I mean, the UK doesn't provide any direct assistance to the government of Sudan. I think there is technical assistance there. And one of the things that this committee has expressed some concern about in the past is because of Sudan's strategic location in relation to migration, yeah. mm, that yeah. there maybe has been a danger that yeah. we've been a bit too close there, and that our concern mm. to manage migration, particularly migration that ends up over here, yeah. has started to outpace enough concern for the human rights situation yeah. in Sudan itself, including the position of refugees in Sudan. How would you respond to that? I mean, is it time to be a, perhaps a little more robust as far as Sudan is concerned? I think the uh, experience in Sudan has been, um, you know, very salutary. So this is a regime that we in Britain, if you just sort of go back uh, to 1980. We had a period where we uh, were close to Sudan during the Cold War. We had a period where Sudan was an enemy during the Cold War because of Cold War reasons. We had a period where we had a very antagonistic relationship to the government of Sudan because it was providing safe haven to Al-Qaeda. We had a period of uh, detente. We had a period of horror in relation to Darfur uh, through the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, we had what felt like a breakthrough in 2005, 2011 in relation to South Sudan, where 
nobody in 2011, or sorry, nobody probably four years ago would have, four years before 2011, would really have believed uh, that the president of Sudan would have granted independence to South Sudan. So there was a moment in 2011 where we began to feel that possibly Sudan was moving in a positive direction, but we had the International Criminal Court also issuing an indictment. Uh, so we were in a position two and a half, three years ago where we were beginning to wonder whether we shouldn't be cautiously engaging more with the government of Sudan. Um, and then, of course, we had these recent events in which all the horror, which was always there in this authoritarian regime, was revealed very directly, both in the public protests and then in the reaction military courts. So I think um, you know, the caution this committee has expressed in the past was correct, and I think we will inevitably be uh, more cautious now over the next few months as we watch what's going on. I mean, certainly nobody's rushing to now engage with this particular regime. Thank you, Richard. We're going to move now on to the voluntary uh, national review which you've published today. And <coughs> over to Lloyd. Thank you, uh, Minister. Um, you spoke in recent debates about your real sincerity and the importance of leadership on uh, this agenda. Of course, your predecessor had agreed that she would be leading the delegation uh, in New York, um, barring, of course, uh, emergency upsets. Uh, but you've decided not to lead the delegation, as I understand it. No, no, I, I uh, will, I, I will to, be. Sorry. So, so you will be leading. Will be. Will. Excellent. You will be oh, leading. That's great. You will be leading. Great. Okay. So, so yeah. to some extent, that question yeah. is, sure, sure, sure. is, no is applaud. I'm pleased. No, I mean, no, no I'm, I'm very pleased to go. I mean, the, the, um, there is a small discussion going on because I have to miss Cabinet and the NSC on that Tuesday, but my intention is to go to New York to lead the delegation. Brilliant. Perfect. Brilliant. Well, we will yeah. see you there, Minister. But you'll be there. I'll, yes. be, I'll be there for the whole two weeks, and well, my other colleagues I, will be I, coming. There's four of us going I, from the well, I, I, I may, may come in with a request for a, a, a pair, if the whips are not this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, sure, yes, I'll, I'll see you there. I'm, I'm sure see. we can apply. Yeah, sure. okay. um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we're pleased about this. Yeah. Uh, one of the other things that we talked about uh, in the statement... Uh, in the House, but mm -hmm. also to you directly, is about um, including stakeholders within that yes. wider delegation. Um, and I've been given nice warm words so far about this, but I want to confirm, have you decided what stakeholders will be engaged in the presentation of the HLPF and all the side events that go along with the HLPF presentation, and how exactly are they going to be involved? Um, my apologies, my understanding is we're still discussing that. I'm going to slightly turn to Paul Nick on this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so we, we're still in the process of finalising the delegation, but our current plans, are, we're in conversation to include um, some stakeholders, one who's involved in the private sector, one who's involved from NGOs, and a youth delegate as well. Um, but we need to have a further conversation with the Secretary of State in terms of just uh, tying that down and putting that down. If it's possible, am I able to probe on how those kind of representatives are being chosen. I mean, have you worked through Bond for the NGO representative? Have you worked yeah. through so the British Youth Council can for I, can their I, ones? I, I, I don't want to... Yeah, I, don't want, I don't want to put Paul Nick on the spot. I mean, so to be absolutely... Um, give you an undertaking, they will be chosen in the fairest and most transparent way we possibly can. I mean, I have absolutely no interest in turning up in New York with uh, some sort of stray strange stooge. I mean, the, the idea would be that this, whoever is representing this are the most senior credible figures that we could possibly have. So if you have any anxieties, I mean, the likelihood is that the sort of people we would have representing uh, on behalf of Bond would be the kind of organisations that you'd expect us to have. But I mean, there's certainly no attempt for us to try to hide anything. No. When, when you can, yeah. I would appreciate if you could just write to sure. us about of course. who the representatives Thanks, will be, sorry. but also... Um, just the process that you went through would be useful, just, just so we've got it on the record. And, and in terms of their involvement then, in terms of which sections you're expecting them to take part in, as it's still a bit fluid, I understand that you can't do that now, but I think yeah. it'll be good Thank in you. writing. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Paul. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, 
Thank you very much, um, uh, Rory. Um, now, the VNR uh, says that the UK adopted a, uh, a comprehensive approach to stakeholder engagement to reflect best practice and ensure inclusivity. <laughs> um, but that doesn't re reflect the views that are expressed by, to us by stakeholders invo involved in the process um, and our own views of parliamentarians. Um, um, the IDC itself has been critical um, about our, our role within that as well. Do you agree that stakeholders could have been engaged more meaningfully in the process? Well, I mean, I think the, the, the key is to get to the bottom of what it is people are anxious about. So you, you'll be aware that there were basically four stages of engagement. Mm. There was a call for, stake, uh, call for case studies between October 2018 and May of 2019, and we received an, a very large number of those case studies. Uh, we did a series of uh, outreach events from October to December 2018, which were co-hosted with organisations such as Bond. Uh, then every department, bar one, did goal-specific events focused on particular goals. And then DFID led uh, an additional series of events, including events in Leeds and Bristol, and I think seven events in London, one of which was on inclusive civil society. Uh, and then we did an 11th March parliamentary event. So the formally, um, I guess we felt, or at least I felt coming in uh, as, a, as a minister yeah, five weeks ago being briefed on this, that we'd done quite a lot. But if there are specific lessons we need to learn from this for the next time we do it, and what these organisations felt hadn't worked, or why these engagement events weren't appropriate, we'd be very happy to hear them. Oh, um, no, that's good because I mean, the uh, so the UK stakeholders for sustainable development talked about it being limited and selective, with the predominant method mm. being um, uh, an online survey. That's how they described it. So they were concerned about that. Um, but the um, the VNR itself um, proposes the introduction of um, a proper mechanism for stakeholder in, um, engagement in the domestic SDGs agenda. I was wondering if you've got a timeline for when such a mechanism can be developed and introduced, and what that might look like. Uh, the answer is I don't have an answer to you on that, um, and I will write to you on that. Thank you very okay. much. Um, now, you said um, during last week's debate, which has been referred to about the SDGs, that you'd hope that would itself inform uh, the final VNR. Um, are you in a position to tell us how men members' contributions to that debate have been taken into account so far in the final review, and uh, has anything changed following that debate? Yes, I mean, I think what probably I took away from the debate, which was uh, helpful, certainly for me, and in the way that we think about this, uh, is this question on consultation. So what I was expecting to happen in the debate, uh, and in fact a lot of my speech was framed around, was the assumption that, and I think this is probably why governments in every country get anxious about this, is that it would become a stick where... Uh, simply to attack us on domestic policy issues. And actually what was interesting in the debate is there was some of that, but uh, a lot of the interventions, including from Lloyd, were around uh, the proper frameworks and the processes and the kind of questions that you're asking. So I think the lessons that I'm taking forward, both in what I'll present to New York and in what we've done, is that rather than being... Um, excessively anxious about uh, the light that it casts on us by doing this. In fact, what people are looking for is much more reassurance on stakeholder engagement consultation and the formal structures, as I've just said, through which that happens. So it's not just a question of us saying it to all people. And I think that's something that if I wasn't forced to stand at this match box and have um, members of parliament quite already have a go at me, uh, would not have landed quite as strongly in my head. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, can you tell us, um, again we've been uh, critical and, um, as a committee about the fact that the VNR has been delayed in submission and wondering uh, why that, why that um, has been delayed why, by, why two, by so, two weeks. Why, yeah, is, it why so is it delayed by two weeks? Um, I don't want to, I mean the answer is that uh, one, of, one of our key partners uh, in bringing the submission together uh, didn't deliver quite on the schedule we were hoping. Um, uh, but I think, to, to be fair to them, two weeks is not 
not the end of the world. But, have, but there was there was a there was a quite a lot of last minute panic in the last few weeks getting all the submissions. Do you yeah. believe that you? Um, I mean, obviously, we've known about the uh, the um, the process and what we since twenty fifteen since it's mm. first in, in, in conceived. Um, do you believe that you've, um, the department's allowed enough time uh, for the review to be completed, I, given, I, given I what think, you just said I think with one of the, resilience? One of, the, one of the challenges, Paul, actually is, um, which we've learnt about, uh, is um, not so much the Whitehall departments, it's the coordination with the devolved administrations. So, quite understandably, the Northern Irish, Welsh and Scottish governments have uh, quite a lot of justified pride in what they've done in relation to the SDGs and the SDG frameworks. Um, and possibly next time round, uh, there's more diplomatic work we could do in advance to make sure that their submissions came in in the sequence in which we were hoping. Mm. I think they had a story that they were very proud of and very keen to tell, mm -hmm. um, quite rightly. Uh, it didn't quite arrive on our desk in the time that we required in order to submit. And that's probably something we could do better next time around. Brilliant. Thank you very much. In a moment, we'll come to some questions relating to the, the evidence from Scotland yep. and Wales. I mean, the, the document is, it, it's, it, it's a big document. There's a lot of um, coverage in there of activity and some really uh, positive and constructive case study uh, examples. But what it doesn't seem to do is to address the UK's performance in a systematic way against each individual target and indicator, which both you, Rory, and your predecessor told us would be the case. Why is it not the case? Um, hmm. I guess... I guess in the end we decided, as a government as a whole, that what we wanted to try to do is use this as an opportunity to um, I think, and the, here we differ a little bit from the way that Scotland and Wales has approached this this has been an opportunity for us to cast light on areas where we've performed less well uh, push back on areas where we think we've maybe performed better than people have acknowledged find intelligent ways of reflecting on the gap between rhetoric and reality or the gap between what we do abroad and what we do at home. But I think we have resisted a little bit the idea that this is somehow a universal scorecard because I think that there is a principle which is a, an important one at the heart of this, which is that we see these as... Um, underpinning values, but we don't see them as... We, I mean, government isn't, in the end, in any democratic society, a purely technocratic process. It's about the allocation of scarce resources, and there will be understandably huge differences between what would happen if, for example, a Conservative government is in and if a Labour government yeah. is in and in terms of the emphasis that you would actually put in practice on different goals and the different ways that you would approach those different goals. So, um, but shouldn't the difference only be the different way you'd approach the goals? These are goals that were adopted under a Conservative government. David Cameron played a crucial role in the framing of the goals. There shouldn't surely be anything within the targets and indicators that is problematic for a Conservative government. And if so, shouldn't that be said explicitly? I think we should certainly say explicitly there's not, none of these goals that are problematic for us. I think the way in which um, you know, we, we would approach goal six would be different. Yeah. We would approach no, it fair, through yeah. a private privatised system. You'd approach it through a nationalised system. I think the, um, the emphasis on um, peace, justice and strong institutions, mm -hmm. you'd have a different mm. attitude to the way in which you'd approach legal aid. Um, I think on climate action, we're now aligned mm -hmm. uh, on net zero, on industry innovation infrastructure, there would mm. probably be quite different views on whether HS2 was prioritised over HS3. I mean, I, I don't... 
I don't you're think talking about the means, whereas what we're really talking about is a, is a set of ends which are internationally agreed and in which the UK has been not just a, a player, but a key player so, in framing so, uh, what those I will, indicators are. I will defer to my much brighter colleague to see mm -hmm. if Nick can provide a more adequate answer than I can. Thanks, Nick. Yeah. I, I think the, the starting point on this is recognition around the data and what data is available. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I, compared to many other VNRs, if you look, mm -hmm. we're, we're submitting ours, New Zealand is submitting theirs at the same time. Yes. They're submitting a 63-page report, which is very qualitative, not much data. Mm -hmm. So ours is a particular data-rich report. But even then, you know, the National Statistics Office, probably one of the strongest in the world, only can measure 70% of indicators. Yeah. Uh, and even within that 70%, only 70% of those can you disaggregate in any, mm -hmm. any fashion. So that there, is, there are a lot of data gaps, mm -hmm. and I, and I, and nor can you get a decent time series that looks at uh, how you're comparing against 2015. Yeah. That, that's the comparison is with 2015. So we don't have enough data, and the way we've chosen to present this report uh, is to, this is a stock take of where we are in 2019, mm -hmm. And this then becomes the baseline for future reports. But why, why didn't you go through each individual target and indicator? And sometimes you might have said, we don't have the data for that, for whatever reason, or we don't yet have the data because it's only been yeah. four years. I think we'd have understood that. The sense I get is there's basically cherry picking here. Well, so the, the statistical annex goes through mm. every single indicator. And it explains what, uh, how we measure in the UK in terms of what the, um, the calculation is. It gives the source of the data, and it also explains why we're using a, a different data series than perhaps uh, the, uh, the UN is using. So it's all there. It's every single data point is in, that we have is in the report. And there are 100 data boxes in the report where we're trying to bring this to life. So actually, I... I think compared to many other reports, there is, there is far more data in this report than many of the other BNRs that we, we see out there. Okay. Uh, Richard. Yeah, um, I mean, I understand what you say. There is a mass of data there, particularly in, in the appendix, the annex to, to the BNR. But do you really think that it, as an example, really addresses the leave no one behind agenda adequately? And particularly when you talk about vulnerable and marginalised groups, homeless, migrants and so on. Because when you look at the um, chapter on Leave No One Behind, what it seems to focus on is examples of good practice rather than data. I and mean, there's a box there, you know, Leave which, No which, One which, Behind. Which page? <laughs> which, Are you on a particular page? Yeah. Um, Sure. Got yeah, but Rich is reading from our briefing, so it doesn't have the page on it. It's the leave no one behind examples. Page 22 about women and... Uh, uh, that, that follows on from it. This is one, it's headed leave no one behind examples. Okay. The first one is the UK and it's investing up to our I mean, 15 million for funding to support the work in health agenda. Then it's got an example about Scotland, then one about Wales. And um, so if you... And if we go to, to the goal 10 in the annex, um, you know, we do proportion of people living below 50% of median income. We do proportion of population reporting having personally felt discriminated against. We do labour share of gross domestic product comprising wages, social protection transfers. Um, I mean, I think there is, um, <coughs> there's, uh, I think what, one of the things where I'd agree with you, Richard, is that there is a broader issue in the way that we deal with uh, the poorest and most marginalized in our mm. society in general. And, and that's true for, I think, generally for the way that we discuss these things. So I think we've tended to focus very strongly for understandable reasons on key markers of relative and absolute poverty and in this report, for example, focusing on 60% of median income. What that disguises generally is that the bottom 10% in our society is much, much, much worse off than, um, you know, in my constituency, for example, uh, the average income is, is 
is, is below 60% of the median income, it's 16,000 pounds a year. But clearly what I see in Tower Hamlets or Poplar is a completely different scale of, um, of human misery than what I see in my constituency. So the, um, I think if you're challenging for us in our next VNR and for Parliament in general, and for the political conversation to start talking about the, the people in the very, the very worst off in our society, by which I mean the, effectively the bottom 10%, so the sort of people that I was dealing with in prison, the sort of people that uh, illegal migrants, uh, some of the most extreme examples, the poor elderly, uh, uh, people with addiction, mental health issues, homelessness, I mean, you're looking at something very, very important, but it's not something that's adequately captured either in the indicators produced under the global goals or in the indicators on which we tend to measure ourselves in government. And I think that's a bigger political problem. Yeah, I, I guess I'm partly saying that, and I certainly yep. would welcome a greater emphasis on that. I suppose more what I'm getting at at this stage, though, is just the way the VNR approaches these things, that, uh, and it... it links her back a little bit to what Stephen said earlier on. There seems to be an emphasis on activity rather than objective and sometimes um, at actually telling it up in lights how it is. You know, for example, I mean, I think the Environmental Audit Committee um, highlighted the fact that it seems to be, I mean, you can find stuff on food insecurity and food poverty in there, but you've got to look pretty hard. You know, and certainly so, so Richard, I mean, this, this is something I tried to address in my speech. I mean, I think this, the, the, and this is why the VNR process is a really good one, because th this comes to the fundamental point um, of um, democratic government and the way that governments and oppositions work together. And the reason it's important is that uh, it does take effort for a government to point out what is not going well, uh, partly because what you're doing there is you're basically saying, understandably, that the, a lot of things that you've been saying on the opposition benches have a point. So we are criticizing ourselves in a document. And, um, and I think what I've learned through that is also an important point for international development because it was also the reason why it's difficult for the... Uh, it, it's actually almost exactly the same reason why the president of DRC is reluctant to admit that there's Ebola. Uh, or the scale of the Ebola threat in Eastern DRC that we're facing. But uh, what we're learning through this is that when governments uh, publicly make statements about their own development progress, they're understandably emphasize the positive and downplay the negative. But I, I do think, to be fair, that, that that is what the job of an opposition party is to do, is to do what you're doing, rather than to expect that even if you were in government, you would necessarily always be emphasizing all the things you've got wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Probably one, one of the reasons I'm asking the question. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Though I think, in, in fairness, you know, some of the, the these questions about things that just are strange that they seem to be missing would be shared by government members as well. Sure. I mean, one example: um, there's a section on overseas ter territories and crown dependencies. Mm -hmm. um, now they feature in the VNR quite prominently on oceans and biodiversity, and that's very good. But there's nothing in there in relation to Goal 16 on illicit financial sure. flows. And that just to me sure. seems odd. Sure. 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 So uh, the point's taken. I mean, but, but I, th I think what you're pointing to there, which we need to be more careful with next time around, is a diplomatic anxiety, which is that we're dealing with um, overseas territories where we're trying to strike the balance uh, of not seeming like we are. Um, engaged in some sort of post-colonial finger-wagging. So we've tended to uh, emphasize the positive and not the challenges. But you're right, we should do more on that. Okay. Yeah. And perhaps one other thing I could just sort of flag up to you is that you know, when examples are given in the VNR, sometimes there seems to be rather more meaty, detailed information, particularly in relation to Scotland and Wales, than there is to England. I mean, the example of that would be in relation to women um, and domestic abuse. 
Um, there's quite a helpful uh, table there, quite a lot of media information there in relation to Scotland. England, it's a lot more sketchy on mm. that now. Is that simply because the quality of data no. being... No, we, no, no, I think the data is the same. I, it's that Scotland prepared it totally independently of us and have approached it in a totally different way. So in the normal way, we would have to learn from Scotland's approach and make sure the next iteration that we... If there were things that they're doing better than us, we need to learn from that. But the answer is those were two separate processes. We were not um, conducting a single United Kingdom process. Yeah. I was going to channel Chris, but I'll bring Chris in, in fact, yes. <laughs> um, uh, on that note, I wanted to ask, was there any relationship going on between the devolved administrations and here in London with regards to how the publishing was done? Because Wales did their report independently, Scotland did theirs. And I take on board you say that you know lessons will be learned, that's a good thing. Yep. But going far, if there wasn't uh, any relationship before now, why was that? And will there be one going no, forward? There the, the, the was... The way. There was a relationship. The, the, the challenge Are you is... sure? Because I need to know you sure. The, no, no, the, the challenge is, Chris, that, um, that those administrations were understandably proud of the work that they'd done. Um, and... I mean, look, I don't, I don't know quite how to say this, and maybe I'm taking a risk by returning to this again and again, but the, the truth is that all development is political yeah. in context in this country as in any other country. And what this document shows is that even in the United Kingdom with the best will in the world, where we are trying to do a process that takes the politics out of things, uh, you can't take the politics out of things. And you can't take the politics out of things because, and this is a really important lesson for development. I mean, this is so fundamental. I mean. Education is political, health is political, resource allocation is political, the way that you do statistics is political, the way you score things. And, and when we go to other people's countries, we, um, we often pretend that isn't the case. We pretend that you can go into Egypt or Indonesia and say, if you're the World Bank, you've got to cut your oil subsidies, and it's just a technocratic discussion, or take off your wheat subsidies. And actually, it's, it goes straight to the political base of a particular party, or you say in Zambia you've got to remove the agricultural subsidies and the entire cabinet are landowners, and this is their, their income, or well, not half the cabinet. Um, uh, so to here, I mean, what, what's your, the, the bruise that you're punching here is that uh, there is a very proud, very competent SNP government in Scotland that has taken a very particular approach to the SDGs. <coughs> and I've been trying politely to avoid saying that they haven't been particularly keen on making this United Kingdom process because quite understandably they feel that they're doing a very good job and they they want to make sure that Scotland's distinct contribution is um, is acknowledged in this report. But but that didn't make it very easy to coordinate and bring together United Kingdom. And the same will be true for the, the government in Wales, which has done some... I mean, look, the Scottish government has... Um, brought in a framework arranged around the SDGs, which is very impressive. It's mm -hmm. quite unlike anyone else. The Welsh Government has passed its own law on uh, well-being, which again has been completely different to the way the English Government has So quite understandably, those devolved administrations are a little, <laughs> little bit uh, reluctant to be sort of swept up in a sort of United Kingdom story. They want to tell their own story in their own way. Richard, did you want to say more? Yeah. Yeah. Lloyd. Yeah. Uh, Minister, oh, Secretary of State. Um, the, the VNR uh, states that the government will review and further strengthen the existing means and mechanisms to oversee its delivery of the goals, and that this review will take place as a matter of priority. Words. And we've seen in the other VNRs of Ireland and Germany where they've then actually developed policy windows from the VNR. What exactly will this review look like and how will it start to tackle the failure of the single departmental plans which quite frankly have been unable to properly capture the transformative nature needed to achieve the SDGs domestically? Okay, so this process will start next Friday. McDyer is our Director General. Um, we'll be meeting the Cabinet Office next Friday in order to begin that process. Really? 
that can you tell us a bit more about how the process is intended to run? Well, at the moment, so as the report lays out, there the are two things. One is that the government has chosen, the, the uh, UK government has chosen to reflect the SDGs in the single departmental plans, as you pointed out. Uh, and I think there are very good examples in the current uh, single departmental <coughs> plans where there are references to, uh, to the goals. So I think Bayes's single departmental plan has got about references to about five, five of the goals in its single departmental plan. And that is the performance framework that the UK government uses to um, demonstrate its, its progress against its uh, policy. And that, at, the at the moment, the government decided that's the right place to put the progress against the goals. But in terms of the review, at the moment there is a cross-government uh, officials coordinated uh, group that has produced the, the VNR. Um, we are going to have a conversation to review what is the and what may be the ministerial and official arrangements going forward. Uh, but at the moment, the process that we've got in place is the one that will continue. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Rory, do you recognise any of the failures of using the single departmental plans for the SDGs? When we met with members from respective departments, yeah. It seemed to be that they didn't really. Know, they, they had been appointed the champions. Yeah. A number of them didn't even know they'd been appointed, apart from getting a letter in their pigeonhole. Some of them didn't really know what all the SDGs were. Um, it wasn't like we were testing them. We were trying to kind of tease out what they knew and how they had been involved. And for one of them, felt like the SDGs had been a kind of afterthought that had been slotted in since. So. Is there a recognition that the, the process with the single departmental plans in the past has failed and there needs to be a recognition of them at least changing the way that they handle the SDGs, otherwise we'll just repeat the same yeah. failure? So I, I think the answer is that I would um, agree with quite a lot of your sentiment. I think it's, it's definitely been an imperfect process. It is a process. This is our first VNR. We're learning from it. I think that um, it will grow and strengthen. Part of that will grow and strengthen, not just because of what happens in the UK. I mean, it is really, really important that the world remains committed to the SDGs. If we end up in a situation that we're sitting in this room in five years' time and somehow the UN itself has begun to veer away from, from the SDGs, then that will massively undermine this process yes. going forward. So. Um, but the school that Stephen and I saw this morning is a really interesting example of the way that the SDGs are becoming really embedded in people's consciousnesses and minds. There's an entire school arranged around the SDGs. And I think, in a way, what happens in a department or with an individual uh, is deeply, deeply affected by the surrounding culture and the surrounding emphasis that the leadership of government... So. You know, one big, to be very blunt, one big challenge is going to be how much emphasis does the next Prime Minister put on the yeah. SDGs? Is mm -hmm. going to be central? Does the, the new um, head of the Cabinet Office put on this? Um, but also the way that the international system operates, the way that citizens operate. Now, the more that citizens arrange themselves around this. I mean, it's a little depressed actually seeing my constituents out there, uh, how few of them were directly engaged with the Global Goals Conversation. Mm -hmm. So when I said... Look, I'm really sorry. I've got to go because I've got to testify on uh, the SDGs to the International Development Set Committee. Instead of them going high five, well done, that's fantastic. There was a lot of come back here. I want to talk to you about climate. I want you to do it. So, um, getting them to really feel that this is a process that's on their side, that this really matters, is going to be central. Otherwise, this becomes a a um, I and mean, what was so lovely about that school, which is going to be what will decide in five or ten years' time whether this works or isn't, is that for them these goals were not a 17 random ideas put together by a committee of men in suits in the basement of the United Nations. These were ethical and moral values about rights and equality, which were driving a very, very diverse community in North London in terms of how they actually think about their individual lives. You've got an 11 year old boy saying the one that matters most to me here is gender equality. I really care about gender equality in the next one. So, I mean, 
that's the way in which this will really work. I mean, yeah. Some of the next questions yeah. are going to be about the communication. Yeah. Yeah. But um, is there any, and I know everything's in flux at the moment yeah. in the government in this sense, but is there any political will for a commitment that there will be a permanent and appropriately resourced SDG coordination team at the heart of government, say in the Cabinet Office, that not just coordinates this when the next VNR comes around, but is week in, week out, coordinating not just our international efforts, yeah. but our domestic so, efforts, a yeah. group of people yeah. who will hold each department. Is there any political will in the current government or in any future government? So, I think, I think, t t I mean, in four weeks' time, we will see who the Prime Minister is, and that person will determine that. I mean, my speculating now whether Boris Johnson or Jeremy Hunt is going to feel that this is something they want to put at the centre of the Cabinet Office. Is this help you? But the yeah. process that you're setting up now will start on will, Friday. Will be open to some of those questions and so allow the that process to be we're starting next Friday is a sincere process, driven at a very senior level by our most senior Director General, driving through the system with the Cabinet Office. Yeah. Mark. Great. Good morning. Um, yeah. Apologise for my voice. Um, uh, uh, Rory, the VNR it represents... Makes you sound like the Attorney General. I, I do. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, I, I do indeed. Um, but um, the VNR presents a great opportunity to communicate um, the SGGs to the public, um, which has not so far been capitalised on. Um, how are you in the department planning to use the launch and presentation of the VNR to engage with people in this incredibly powerful agenda? Well, we, we're trying hard. I mean, I, I, this event that I did, uh, launching it today in the primary school, we had journalists from The Guardian, from The Telegraph, from The Independent. We had press association cameras. We've got a social media campaign. That's going to lead into my presentations in New York. Um, we've obviously done a debate in the House of Commons. I mean, there is still an issue which goes beyond our department of really exciting people about this. And it may not be that, it may be the timing isn't ideal. I mean, a lot of those journalists want to ask me questions about the leadership campaign when I'm trying to get them focused <laughs> on the VNR. Um, but it's been something that I've really thrown myself into. I mean, I, I hope you acknowledge that um. I, um, you know, there the was a choice available to us when I took over six weeks ago to hide from this. Yeah because yeah. people would be worried that the entire conversation would be potentially about feedbacks. Um, instead of which, we've really lent into this, and we've really uh, been proud of what we've done and been as honest as we can about... You know, the, the, the lesson that we've been driving here is to try to be a lesson of humility and self-reflection, and I'm very keen to promote this work. I'm very keen to promote these values. I mean, and, and, and this is also important, I think. Um, in terms of our own single departmental plan in DFID, and, and this relates to Lloyd's questions about single departmental plans, the big change I've been able to bring in in the last five weeks is to reframe our entire single departmental plan around the Sustainable Development Goals. And actually that wasn't the case before. Right? So the five key uh, framing devices for our entire single departmental plan, and that was rewritten in five weeks, is now about this. Um, and it's a really powerful tool for me because this is the way that you talk about how our action on poverty and our action on climate and the environment come together is this tool. This is, you know, this is a gift to me. So I'm deeply, deeply proud of it. I'm trying to promote it in this in many ways as I can. That's great. Yeah. And you know, on a similar thread, um, I mean, the VNR does not discuss the government's role in communicating or raising awareness of the goals. And it focuses very much on the role of civil society and local organisations in performing this function. Um, how, what more can government do in order to uh, communicate the goals? Um, and also, is this something that, not just falling on DFID, mm. but government in totality? Um, you know, what, what, how do you see the role for government? Well, the, the way this would take off, I mean, I keep pushing this back, the way that it would take off is if you had a... Prime Minister who made this central to their domestic agenda. Mm. That, that's what would really transform Absolutely. this. Yeah. Uh, and if they did make it central to their domestic agenda, they could do it in a whole series of ways. They could make it absolutely central to the Cabinet Office. So the things that um, 
just as if you had a prime minister who really cared about the union, they might mm. put a really pumped up function of union proofing everything into the cabinet office. If you had a prime minister that put the environment and climate change in the centre of the you could imagine a really pumped up function of the cabinet office greening every bit that the government did, and you could do the same on the SDGs. You could also follow the Scottish example on uh, frameworks, you could follow the Welsh examples on legislation. I mean, if you had a Prime Minister who really made this the framework through which they thought mm -hmm. about Absolutely. development of this country, it's mm. a huge amount of choice. Mm. I mean, you've had the reputation as being not just a good Secretary of State, but a rather famous filmmaker. Um, but I'm afraid you were superseded um, in a previous evidence session when we had Richard Curtis um, before us. <laughs> um, and he told us about um, plans to campaign for a decade of delivery um, on the SGDs from 2020. Will you and the UK government pledge to support this campaign and drive its own delivery of the goals forward? Yes. I mean, I think actually, oddly, um, this experience has been quite good for us. So when David Cameron announced that we'd be marketing <coughs> our own homework domestically mm -hmm. in 2015, uh, there was a loss of nervousness, a lot of nervousness. Mm -hmm. I mean, people thought this is completely crazy. I mean, we're... Um, and that this was totally inappropriate and that all we were doing was just providing more uh, opposition backbench business committee debates on our head. And actually, that hasn't been the lesson that I would take from this. I would say to a future Prime Minister that this has been approached in a much less political, much more bipartisan, much more generous fashion than people would have expected. And that actually, we can have the confidence to keep talking about these things. Um, and that some of the stuff that happened in 2015, 2016, uh, which was to try to use the SDGs to challenge domestic legislation has faded a little bit because I think people have accepted that it's true that governments will make different decisions on allocation, different decisions on the means. And if we can get that, then I think we really can put these values at the heart of it. I mean, this is about a values conversation. It's about what we think development is, what we think growth should be, what we think a good society mm. should be. And the more that we develop a common conversation about it, what was striking the school was that they were struggling with I imagine uh, 50 or 60 different nationalities mm -hmm. potentially in that school, right? And they were looking for a common narrative about what it meant to be British. And they had found in the SDGs a very, very good way of finding something that every different person at school could relate to in terms of their rights, in terms of their views on equality particularly, and their views on the environment. So if we can make it something that feels more like a common shared set of national values, mm. obviously adjusted for the fact that, you know, when we talk about goal six, clean water and sanitation, that is, thank goodness, by and large, something that we have in this country. We're measuring ourselves in a completely different way to the way that other countries will measure themselves on sewerage and clean water supply. Um, but that the overall idea that these things have to go together, that development isn't a single thing. I mean, if you go back in time to our original act, development sounded to us as though it meant just one thing. It just yeah. meant extreme yeah. poverty. Yeah. And extreme poverty was generally measured just in incomes. Yes. Uh, so this has been a really transmitted conversation for us, but it's also transmitted conversation for what we're trying to achieve in the United Kingdom, because presumably all of us, from whichever party, are not just talking about how to increase our GDP. We're talking about how that money is allocated and we're talking about the question that Richard's Absolutely. raising about how that affects the bottom 10% of our society. Yeah. My strongest memory from the visit to Torriano Primary School was a little boy when we asked the group which of the goals was most important and he went for 16 and we asked why and his initial answer was all about the US-Mexican border. It was really interesting. And then he slightly, was slightly tentative and said, and there's another reason someone got knifed on my estate last week. And for me, security is about where I live as well as about what happens on the US-Mexican border as a 10-year-old boy. And I thought that was an incredibly moving and powerful way of kind of making that connection between the global and the, and the local. Look, I really welcome what you've said, uh, Rory, about um, kind of the future and if a prime minister takes um, a lead on this. And clearly one of the challenges is going to be how to sustain 
priority focus and momentum after New York and the, the HLPF. Is the implication of what you're saying that really the Cabinet Office should now be in the driving seat of this, that DFID does great international work and rightly leads on it, but in fact driving some of these domestic issues really ought to be at the heart of government with the Cabinet Office? Uh, I think, I'm afraid, realistically, that has to be a conversation for the next Prime Minister. Fair enough. That's not, not my, my call. No. And is, I mean, thinking back to your previous roles outside of DFID, in all honesty, how far did the SDGs figure in conversations when you're in other departments? Um, the problem is, let's, let's take my last uh, two domestic parts. So let's take 16 and look at the MOJ. Um, so if you look at the indicators, number of victims of intentional homicide in 100,000 was an indicator that we took very, very seriously. Okay. Um, Conflict-related deaths, obviously less so. Um, you know, our conflict-related deaths are currently 1.1 per million in our mm -hmm. population, so it's not really a 16.1.2, not very important. Um, sexual violence is very important. I mean, we were doing an enormous amount of um, domestic violence. Proportion of population feels safe walking alone around the area they live. I think you know relates to your mm -hmm. um, the young man <laughs> you're talking to in the school. Um, but more broadly, I guess the the risk is that if you put peace, justice, and strong institutions up in the Ministry of Justice, the the risk is that it you need good leadership to explain to people why that isn't a glimpse of the binding obvious. I mean, mm -hmm. people will think... Mm -hmm. No, I get that. Yeah. Or, or if you put clean water and sanitation up in the Environment Agency, they mm -hmm. might think, or off what? They might think, well, okay, then that's what we do. We do clean water and sanitation. Mm -hmm. How does it help us to know that it's a global goal? Or quality education and the Department mm -hmm. of Education, they probably think quality education is kind of what they're about. Um, so... It's, I think it's probably about how these 17 come together rather than how they work. I mean, probably the interesting thing about the Scottish and Welsh framework is not actually the telling the Department of Education that quality education matters. It's about how you think about these things holistically, how you think about what a valuable life is or a valuable society mm -hmm. is as a whole. Thank you. Richard. Yeah, I mean, whatever the challenges there may be of trying to embed SDG thinking in other departments, at least in DFID. I mean, it has been seen to be something that's been important from would go on that. But um, how, I mean, assuming that you do stay in this post, do you think you can really make sure it's embedded even more, even in DFID? I mean, there yeah. could be so, a danger even yeah, within yeah, DFID. Yeah, no, there's a, actually it's yeah, 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 no, I, I agree, document. Richard. I mean, I think that there is still a still a lot, lot of work to be done in DFID. I mean, I, but I, I don't think we should be complacent about what's happened in DFID. I mean, I think there's still a, a tension. Um, there is a tension here. I mean, we were set up in that act to focus on extreme poverty. And some of these indicators relate to extreme poverty indirectly, not directly. I mean, there are clear connections, right? There's a clear connection between gender equality and poverty. There's a clear connection between peace, justice, and strong institutions. Uh, but when you begin to get into life <coughs> below water, you are beginning to move out of the traditional comfort zone of, of DFID. And um, given that I'm somebody who really thinks mm. that the insight of these goals is correct, that actually development must be sustainable, and for development to be sustainable, it must be sensitive to the environment, and that includes life below water. Uh, I will actually be using this as a tool to try to change the way that DFID thinks about things and to challenge staff in DFID to be less resistant to pure environmental proposals. And do you think um, there is perhaps more that could be done in terms of DFID's own procurement processes there um, at the moment? funding calls, they don't always, in fact, quite rarely would they reference the SDGs. Is that something you'd like to see changed? Mm. That's a very good question, Richard. That's quite a technical question. I'm going to drop one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I think if you look at most of our contracts are about um, that we put out for calls are to deliver a particular activity, and then you can probably look back and see there's a line of sight in the business case for the SDGs. So I wouldn't necessarily expect all our contract proposals to explain everything about the SDGs. I think where we are running perhaps a competitive fund, like the small grant scheme or, or the civil society schemes that we've got or research, then perhaps we should be uh, asking ourselves um, more explicitly about the SDGs. But again, I think many of the choices we're already making, so on the research programme, many of the choices we're already making, if we're going to do research on um, you know, technology, uh, uh, low energy technology, we've already made a choice about linking that back to the SDGs. So I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that it will always make a huge amount of difference if you put it in the call explicitly because we've already made the choice in advance. Well, yeah, I, I can see that as far as differing from making that choice, but if part of the objective is to try to embed a new way of thinking, I mean, presumably, and that, if I've read Broad correctly, is, is what, what, what you're saying, that it should start to inform just a whole mindset about how development is approached, then presumably that needs to somehow reflect itself through into procurement processes, you know, e even if they're for specific things? Well, we would certainly want our suppliers to be thinking hard about uh, how they are, what their offer is around the, the SDGs. Um, I mean, there are potentially some ways you could use government procurement as an incentive to drive certain behaviour, um, and there has been some thought given to that in the recent past. Uh, but I... I I don't think we're in a position, well, certainly I'm not in a position to say how the risk government should be doing this procurement. Rory, do you think uh, it would, that DFID needs to specialise a bit within the goals? I mean, clearly the entire gamut policy needs to be aligned with the goals. And, mm. You know, that links to your point about mm. um, trying to create a new way of thinking. Mm. But the Dutch government, for example, has said, right, we're actually going to show leadership and has put a lot of emphasis on SDG 16. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a case for the UK to say, well, this is an area in which we have got a particular specialism yeah. in which we'd like to actually show leadership, and if so, yeah. which ones? Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think this is a real uh, mm -hmm. challenge for us. Um, the, um, and my, my instinct is always that we, we have to specialise, that the world is too big and the problems are too large for us to pretend that we can do everything equally well. Um, the problem that DFID has is that every Secretary of State that comes in suddenly has a new mm. priority. So, um, uh, to take an example, I mean, traditionally we didn't do work on disabilities. A new Secretary of State would come in, suddenly we have to stand up a new Secretary of State on disabilities. Or we didn't have experts on urban planning in cities, and we'll suddenly decide that we need to do something around Global Goal 11, and then we have to stand it all up. Again, we haven't traditionally had great, um, at least for 20, 30 years, great specialty in infrastructure. That's tended to be other development agencies have done that. We've tended to focus more on issues like health and education. Um, but then, of course, you get a sudden focus on economic development, and there'll be put more emphasis on infrastructure. So DFID itself has to... Um, have the capacity to respond to this strange phenomenon of new priorities coming in with, with new leadership. Um, but I would support DFID in two regards in pushing back. W one of them is that if we genuinely don't have expertise in an area, we have to think very, very seriously before we go into that area. Now, I believe in my case, that climate and the environment is such a big issue that we can't afford not to have expertise in that area. So I will be pushing resources into that, and I will be forcing the department to hire more people in that area. But we can't do that across 17 goals. And I think the second thing is that I would like to move to a world in which there was much more discretion for our country directors, where it isn't all done through central marriage programs, and that they are able to work out what is the most useful thing they can do with their money in Nepal, what they can do in Malawi. So in my real dream, if I remained in this job for three years, 
um, would be to actually delegate that authority down to them. In fact, maybe even more radical, I've been interested in piloting a model where you could almost set up a British Development Foundation Nepal, where you'd have a chief executive appointed with full control over that budget, and you'd say to them, over to you to decide what you want to do over the next four years, and the control that I would have over you is whether or not to top you up and give you your funding again in four years' time, which is what we do on our national parks. So mm-hmm. if you're the chief executive of the Lake District or Peak District National Park, you get your funding from DEFRA, three-year settlement, and then you essentially decide what you want to do with that money. And that is actually a very, very empowering thing because it actually allows you, even with relatively small resources, to do that. And I think if you were the chief executive of the Development Foundation in Nepal, uh, it's a job that any one of us would kill to have because you would have the ability to really think, okay, what do, what do I and my team think are the best things that we can do in Nepal over the next four years? And you might have much more freedom on who you could hire, and you might have much more freedom about the civil service regulations and security regulations, and you might be able to make much longer term decisions, and you might be able to go into very unusual areas and build up expertise there in that country, which didn't exist elsewhere. So, so that would be my long term vision if I was lucky enough to still be here. And thanks, Richard. Chris. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just returning to what we talked about earlier yeah. on climate and your ambitions for climate. The really important but problem we have is you have one department, for example, your own, who's really ambitious about increasing funding, whilst in another department you could be spending or giving credit, for example, UK Export Finance, 99% of its funding is going towards fossil fuel projects in the developed world, which then leads to a developing world, which then leads to long term use of fossil fuels by other countries that we've invested in, which completely undermines the department and what you're trying to achieve here. Would you agree that it'd be, this would be far more effective for SDGs if there's proper policy coherence? Because we've heard repeatedly on this committee about the lack of coherence, where one hand's not speaking to the other. So, Chris, I mean, your logic is correct, but the choices here are choices that we need to explain to people what, 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 what that means. For better or worse, we have a huge number of people in this country employed in um, oil and gas exports. And essentially the decision that you're making there comes right down to whether you support a small SME from Aberdeen providing... Sorry, I might have got this wrong. What I was aiming at was UK export finance. No, but that will be for that small... I mean, that that will be for the small SME from Aberdeen going to Basra to provide the oil infrastructure support for BP on the ground. I mean, that's... So if you look at the billion pounds that's been put in uh, export finance to Iraq over the last few years, which is a very good way of looking at this, some of that is around water and sanitation infrastructure. Enormous amount of that is around fossil fuels. And that is connected, uh, yes, partially with big, partially British-owned companies like BP and Shell, but an enormous amount to do with the uh, supply chain in oil and gas and exploration. Um, so one of the challenges, and this is true, you know, you could make the same challenge to me quite rightly ethically on our defence industry. We have a, an economy in this country which is very heavily dependent uh, in certain parts of the country on fossil fuels in other parts of this country on the export of defence equipment. And that poses real foreign policy and development challenges because it means that we are having to weigh up the interests of quite literally hundreds of thousands of jobs in this country against our stated environmental policy challenges. So what can I do for my department? Uh, I am very keen to shift the investment that we put Uh, through, for example, CDC into a fossil fuel generation and shift them over to renewables. Um, I'm very keen to make sure that our development assistance is directed towards environmentally friendly projects. I don't want our development assistance to be damaging the environment. But I think there is a much, much bigger strategic policy decision that would have to be made at a number 10 level about whether we wanted to go into a world where... um, We decided that we were, for example, not supporting a medium-sized enterprise working in 
uh, secondary downstream oil supply in Basra, based in the United Kingdom. Um, it partly answers my question, to be fair. I think the point I'm getting at is if you have one depart- if you have a policy coherence across all departments where someone's leading on that, for example, as suggested yeah. earlier at the Cabinet Office, wouldn't the decisions be better measured and the outcomes be less hypocritical, to put it bluntly, if there was proper policy coherence across all the departments? Because uh, uh, another example I could give you is if we look at uh, human rights, there's barely a little mention across the SDGs, yet more than 90% of SDGs are based on human rights, so they're outcomes for individuals. So, uh, so what I'm asking for is, how do you see policy coherence going forward? What type of leadership would it take? Because, I mean, this is, this is why, to, to repeat myself a little bit, this process is very useful. If we aren't scoring political points off each other, but are trying to be honest about the... Um, the realities of why development is difficult in this country or elsewhere, because I'm, I'm going to restrain myself from turning it around and saying to you the obvious, which would what would be your policy towards SMEs and the oil business in Aberdeen? I mean, I'm not going to do that to you, but but the reason I'm not going to do that to you is that it should be apparent to all of us around the table that these are difficult issues. The same would be true if Richard quite understandably, asked an issue around BAE systems, and I said, what's our attitude towards workers in Barrett? I mean, these are not easy questions to answer. Um, And I feel that human rights needs to be very central in what we do, but it is... um, And that's why I was very reluctant, in some ways, to spend as much as we were spending in Zimbabwe. But in a sense, Zimbabwe uh, is easy. So if I'm, you know, wash my dirty linen in public, Zimbabwe is easy because Zimbabwe both had severe human rights challenges and a very poor performance in development, and I didn't feel that we were getting much value for money in what we were doing there. It becomes more difficult when you look at a summer like Ethiopia, yeah. which is yeah. a great development success story where an enormous number of people yeah. are being taken out of poverty, where the economy is growing 6.5% a year, and I have to then decide what our attitude is towards human rights and whether we can continue to support people there. So I think that the only reason I'm kind of clawing into these things and taking quite a lot of political risk in doing so is that we have to try to be open about this because, of course, yes, the charge of hypocrisy is always a very very reasonable charge to make, but it is important to try to explain to the public what the reason for this apparent hypocrisy is. Okay. And I guess... With the compilation of the VNR, it's given an opportunity to maybe think differently about policy coherence, given it's the yep. first one. I wanted to know what efforts will be made to create better systems within government, both to monitor and track UK's performance on policy coherence. And I know we might not have the answers yet, but what do you think they might look like? Well, I think the government already has got a uh, recent track record in trying to get at this cross departmental coherence with so the establishment of the National Security Council. Um, the International Climate Fund board that you, the committee, has um, taken evidence on in the past from both the Department of International Development, Bayes, uh, cross-government efforts on violence against women and, and girls. So there, there are a number of attempts at trying to create this kind of uh, cross-government coherence. And I think, and, and there is increasingly conversations across government about how can you replicate this kind of approach in the national security space, broadly, in the domestic space. So thought is thought has been given to that, but I think it comes back to the question around what the next steps, one of the next steps in terms of the uh, taking forward the uh, the SDGs, and as the Secretary has said, this is for the next administration. Um, but I, I wouldn't say there's been no uh, coordination, because I think what is going on in the national security space has been quite a good example of what can be done. More to do. Well, there's always more to do. Chris, thank you. Secretary of State Nick, thank you both very much indeed for your evidence today. And can I say just two things really by way of closing? One is to, to welcome warmly that you will be leading the delegation to uh, New York. That is, that is very, very welcome. And I guess to say, I hope to see you here again in the future. Thank you. Well, very much. Thank you, thank you all very, very much indeed. Thank you for a very, very um, intelligent conversation. And uh, whoever succeeds me, please, please keep pushing on this. And I think the way in which you've approached this has been very positive because I think 
people were very, um, they felt they were taking huge political risks to do this. And I think the way that you've approached it will make it much easier for people to lean into it in the future. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed. Thank you.